Hello and welcome to the bonus material for Holy Week. Unlike the other videos for Holy Week, this is not a full act of worship. It doesn't have any of the music and uh, the other things that go with the other videos. But we're just going to have uh, the stories and then a brief reflection on each. And it fills in the gap in the story in Luke between the events of Palm Sunday and the beginning of the Passion narrative. Now it's up to you how you want to use these. Uh, the intention is to help you just to dig a little bit deeper into the story and uh, so my suggestion would be that you might uh, listen to the reflection with the Bible passage open and then after you've uh, heard the reflection you might go back and reread the passage and then turn that into a time of private prayer but that's entirely up to you. For now we're going to pick up the story exactly where we left off on Palm Sunday in chapter 20 of Luke's Gospel. Luke chapter 20 verses 1 to 19. One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and telling them the good news, the chief priests and the scribes came with the elders and said to him, Tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? Who is it who gave you this authority? He answered them, I will also ask you a question, and you tell me. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? They discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he'll say, Why did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, all the people will stone us, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. Then Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. He began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and leased it to tenants and went to another country for a long time. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants in order that they might give him his share of the produce of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Next he sent another slave, that one also they beat and insulted and sent away empty-handed. And he sent still a third, this one also they wounded and threw out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son, perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they discussed it among themselves and said, This is the heir, let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, Heaven forbid! But he looked at them and said, What then does this text mean? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the scribes and chief priests realised that he had told this parable against them, they wanted to lay hands on him at that very hour, but they feared the people. By what authority? There seems to be an innate resistance to God in human beings. I'm aware of it in myself, and for me, becoming a Christian meant effectively the surrender of my soul to God, and I was very resistant to doing it. That resistance seems to be a common human experience, as common to all of us as grief and suffering and death. And in fact, it's not unconnected with all three. We are interested in the idea of God, so long as it remains purely theoretical. But we seem to be very uncomfortable with the idea of God becoming personal and of having a relationship with him. We often point to those who've had religious conversion experiences as people who've gone slightly mad, who've gone, gone off the rails a bit. But in fact, the testimony of almost everybody who's been through such an experience is that it is precisely entering into that relationship with God that puts us back on the rails, that stops the madness and restores a kind of perspective on life that we find deeply healing. It's given me a perspective on life that I never had before. And it's kind of been a light to my path and it's rescued me over and over again from my own idiocy, from my selfishness and from the bad decisions which for some unaccountable reason I seem to think were a good idea at the time. 
but perhaps most of all, it's given me a path to live by that has never let me down and has never failed to lead me into a rich, fulfilled and happy life. This is the sort of fruit that God brings out in human beings when he dwells in them, living in a temple not made of stone, but in a temple made of flesh, in our own hearts, in our own lives. And as we discovered uh, on Palm Sunday when Jesus overturned the tables in the temple, what God most wants is to dwell with us, to be in relationship with him. And yet we instinctively keep him out. The parable of the tenants in the vineyard was a story that Jesus told against the Jewish authorities of his day, but it applies equally well to us in our day. The vineyard is the ancient symbol of Israel, of God's people. When handed over to God and tended by him, it produces fruit, notably wine, the symbol of joy in the ancient world. But we keep God out. We've taken it over for ourselves. We're no longer letting God in. When God tries to speak to us, we send his prophets away with increasing violence. And when at last he sends his son in love, we kill his son in the hope of finally having the vineyard to ourselves. But in doing so, we reap a terrible harvest on ourselves and upon our world, not by God's will, but by our own. And yet, ironically, when we try to keep God out, to main control of our lives, we fall prey to the forces of this world that want to manipulate us and control us. You can be my friend if you do this, if you don't do that, if you buy this product, if you hold these opinions, if, if, if. In a godless world, love is an abstract concept which is held perpetually out of our reach, never to be grasped. But Jesus shows his love for us by giving himself entirely for us. It is a love unknown, the passion of God expressed unconditionally, long before we respond and without any guarantee that we will ever do so. That kind of love is so true that it carries an authority we have never known before. It is not of human origin, but of divine origin. It's a love that wants nothing from us but our presence. A love that does not want to manipulate or control us and will never do so. But wins our heart utterly. So that our surrender finally becomes a free will decision on our part of utter joy. Like someone finally accepting a proposal of marriage. Such a love transforms us. When we stop treating God like an abstract concept and let him in, we experience God as pure and perfect love. And that love transforms us. It makes us into generous living beings, able to look at one another again in love, prepared to have our hearts broken for love, able to weep over Jerusalem and over the state of the world, because God has replaced our hearts of stone with hearts of flesh, hearts able to love again, because God carries the authority of love.